Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> thanks again for that introduction. So, um, probably know who I am by now, but I'm Lauren. I'm the Education and Research Program Associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. And today, I'm excited to introduce two of our latest soil health guidebooks, one on reducing production risks and the other on um, mitigating anthropogenic climate change. But before jumping into the guidebooks, I just want to take a quick moment to orient you to OFRF and the motivation behind our recent foray into soil health research. So we've been around for about 30 years, and our mission is to foster the improvement and widespread adoption of organic farming systems. And one way in which we do this is to communicate directly with organic farmers and ranchers around the nation to understand what their most pressing research needs are. In 2016, we published the National Organic Research Agenda, which was based off of over 1,000 survey responses from organic producers around the nation, trying to understand what their most pressing needs were. And we also supplemented this with a number of listening sessions as well. And so a number of interesting research needs emerged. A lot of people really interested in more information on organic soil health management practices, followed closely by more research on organic weed management strategies, and as we've seen, those kind of go hand in hand very often. And about half of respondents wanted to know more about the effects of an organic diet on human health, and also more organic insect, pest, and disease management strategies. So very clearly, people want to know more about how do we enhance soil health on organic farms. And so this is what motivated us to publish a series of guidebooks on soil health covering a range of topics from selecting and managing cover crops to cultivar selection and crop breeding for organic systems. And all of these reports are available to download for free on our website, OFRF.org. And we have some samples outside for you as well. So this winter, we published three additional guidebooks in this series. And I have the chance just to hopefully pique your interest in two of these today, one looking at so best soil health management practices in organic systems to build soil health to reduce production risks and increase farm resilience. And the other looking at soil health management practices to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and curb the effects of climate change. So I'll start off by talking about our, our risk management guidebook. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Mark Schoenbeck, who's one of our soil experts and who is really the brain power behind uh, both of these publications. So we all know that all farmers face many different risks, whether they're the, ranging from the terrible trio of insect pests, weeds, and pathogens to abiotic risks such as drought or unexpected weather events like an untimely freeze or an extreme weather event like hail or flooding. But perhaps the most risky um, thing the farmer has to deal with is the loss of it, the farm's working capital, which is healthy, fertile soil. And, and this is an overarching risk that can be less obvious, but it can be very costly in the long term. So producers often have to work their soils pretty hard to make ends meet in that daily struggle of producing and, and, and getting crops to market. But this can lead to issues like soil compaction or reduced fertility and soil erosion. And soil erosion is probably one of the biggest production risks because while something like a hail event destroys the current crop, and you know, low soil fertility can be remedied over the course of a few years through improved practices, it takes nature about 500 years just to replace one inch of topsoil that's been lost to wind or water erosion. And organic producers can't fall back on synthetic inputs to help them um, overcome these production risks. So they really have to rely on healthy soils to buffer them from these abiotic and biotic risks. And that's because healthy soils provide a number of services to farmers. They help to provide, retain, and recycle nutrients. They protect water quality by reducing a nutrient runoff into the environment around them. They provide habitat to diverse and beneficial soil organisms. And they also can enhance crop resistance and resilience to different pathogens and pests. And in general, healthy soils require fewer inputs, which can be a soft, uh, direct, a uh, cost savings to growers. So one of the things this guidebook does is outlines different practices that organic producers can implement to build soil health on their farms. For example, crop rotations, cover cropping, 
the use of compost and other organic amendments, and conservation tillage practices. And these uh, practices can provide a number of benefits. So if we think about cover cropping, we've heard about in some other talks, can help to um, enhance soil structure and aerate soils and provide soil organic matter that's really important for um, those microorganisms. And then compost and other organic amendments can be really important for providing timely and sufficient plant nutrition, which is obviously very important for sustaining crop yields and producing quality crops. However, there's a trade-off because all of these management um, practices have some risks associated with them. So while healthy soil in and of themselves almost always reduce production risks, any time a producer adopts a new strategy, they already have to be thinking about new challenges, costs, and risks, and how to deal with those. So, um, so if we think back to um, cover cropping, obviously it can be very beneficial for soil fertility and soil structure. However, you have to really think carefully about what cover crop you're implementing into your system because you want to make sure you're not choosing a cover crop species that's going to steal moisture and nutrients away from your cash crop. And implementing cover cropping can also result in the delay of planting your cash crop. Similarly, with compost and other organic amendments, although something soil fertility is very important, um, we don't want too many nutrients because if you're applying more than needed, you're just throwing money down the drain, and then those excess nutrients can be leaching out of your system. And then instead of fueling crop growth, maybe you're spurring weed growth, which is obviously not what you want either. So the guidebook kind of goes through both the pros and cons of different practices and helps farmers weigh, hmm, I wonder if this is the right practice really for me to be implementing, and it provides some practical tips and discussions around kind of how to choose these practices. So one example I really like is a discussion on choosing and managing cover crops. So we heard a lot about tillage radish in Emily's talk, and it can be a great cover crop because it has this really deep rooting system that helps to break up and aerate the soil. But at the same time, that deep rooting system means it can be a heavy consumer of soil moisture. So if you're in an arid region, this might not be the best crop species for you to implement. Um, on the other hand, something like pearl millet is a relatively drought tolerant cover crop, but it's a lighter user of soil moisture. So in an arid region, that might be a better decision as a crop to implement in your cover crop rotation. And the guidebook also talks about um, how to navigate all the different organic amendments that organic producers have to choose from. So being aware of any sweeping claim that a particular amendment is gonna be a silver bullet issue for any production risk that you're facing. Making sure that you're selecting an, uh, an amendment with very specific objectives in mind. And always trying to use a new amendment on a very small area of land. And maybe in a side-by-side -side trial of a practice you're already implementing so you really understand what benefit, if any, that new amendment is bringing to your system. So we've only had a, a little bit of time to briefly cover all the content in this risk management book, but we have some copies outside, and again, it's available to download for free on our website. I encourage you to check it out. I think it's a great tool for farmers to use as they try to weigh the benefits um, and, and the pros and cons of different practices. And if we think back to these production risks that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we know that they're only going to be exacerbated in the face of climate change. So pests and diseases are going to shift geographic ranges, their life cycles are going to change, most likely we're going to see intensified weed competition, and already we're seeing more intense and frequent extreme weather events. And so this means that organic producers, or just producers in general, really have a major stake in trying to curb the effects of climate change that they're already experiencing. And so this leads me nicely into our second guidebook, which focuses on um, soil health practices to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. So in this guidebook, we still maintain our perspective on soils, but now look at the role they can play in mitigating climate change. And that's because healthy soils can help convert uh, uh, organic residues into stable organic matter and therefore trap uh, greenhouse gases in the soil. 
So in the United States, um, there are a number of different sources of greenhouse gas emissions, not just agriculture, obviously, but also the generation of electricity, transportation, industry, and commercial and residential uses. And carbon dioxide, which is represented in this pie chart in blue, is the most prevalent greenhouse gas that we emit, but it's not the most potent. Rather, methane, which I have in orange, and nitrous oxide, are much more potent greenhouse gases, meaning that part for part, they contribute significantly more to global warming than does carbon dioxide. And the importance of these greenhouse gases becomes even more apparent when we hone in on only the agricultural sources of greenhouse gases. So this pie chart is showing us in the United States the greenhouse gas emissions, which account for about 9% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see now, Nitrous oxide in gray <coughs> takes up the lar largest portion of the pie, followed by methane and then carbon dioxide. So that means that the agricultural sector really has an opportunity to affect and reduce emissions of two of the most potent greenhouse gases. So if we want to be able to reduce these emissions, first we need to understand where they're coming from. So I'll just give you a brief overview, because um, I know we're running short on time probably. So nitrous oxide emissions are mostly related to the denitrification and other microbial transformations of soluble nitrogen that we add into our soils, either in the form of synthetic <coughs> nitrogen or manure, and it can also be associated with um, manure storage systems as well. Methane mostly comes from livestock production, so enteric methane that's produced by livestock, but also by manure storage facilities and also in uh, flooded rice production systems where we have anaerobic or low oxygen content in our soils. <laughs> and carbon mostly is uh, emitted during the use of uh, farm machinery that runs on fossil fuels, but it's also found as embodied energy in some fertilizers. So now that we know where these greenhouse gases are coming from, we can start to think about how we can change our practices to reduce their emissions. So for nitrous oxide, which remember is one of those very potent greenhouse gases, one of the first things to do is to identify your soil structure because nitrous oxide emissions tend to happen in anaerobic or compacted soils that are also very moist. So if you have a very heavy soil like clay, heavier soils have about two to three times the emission factors for nitrous oxide compared to a lighter soil such as like a silty or sandy soil. So the first thing is to understand what are your risks for nitrous oxide emissions. And then we want to remedy those characteristics such as compaction or low oxygen and high moisture um, conditions in the soil so that we reduce the likelihood that we're going to be emitting nitrous oxide. One way to do that is to implement deep-rooted cover crops that help to break up the soil and aerate the soil and improve um, soil tilth and structure and then also can mop up excess moisture. And when it comes to reducing methane emissions, implementing something like uh, management intensive rota rotational grazing can reduce methane emissions, but also sequester carbon. And so these are systems where you have a grazing area that's sectioned off into different paddocks. And one paddock is intensively grazed for a short period of time, and then the cattle are rotated, so that area of land has time to regenerate and the grass and the forage can grow back. And it's during that regenerative time that we see a lot of this carbon sequestration. And by enhancing the forage quality that the livestock are consuming, that actually helps to reduce um, methane emissions from the livestock. And when we're thinking about carbon, we really have a lot of opportunities to sequester more carbon. So take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil as deep as we can get it so it stays there for a long time. And the Natural, Nat, Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, has developed um, four principles of soil health that really are very powerful in terms of being able to sequester carbon. So keeping the soil covered as much as possible, diversifying crops by using polycultures or diversified crop rotations, maintaining living roots um, as much as possible throughout the year, so cover cropping is really a, a powerful strategy, and then minimizing soil disturbance. And there are some estimates that if we were to implement these best soil health management practices worldwide, we could reduce the amount of carbon by about 2 billion tons of carbon per year, 
which is about 12% of our admissions worldwide. So clearly these practices can be really powerful, but as we saw in the risk management guidebook, they can be difficult and challenging for growers to implement. And so our theoretical knowledge of what needs to be done to combat the major challenging challenges facing society today, such as climate change, are there. We know, we know in theory what needs to be done, but implementation remains challenging. And so that's really where these guidebooks come in, is that they help farmers as they weigh these pros and cons and make these decisions about how do I take something very broad, like cover cropping, and, and make that a reality on, on my farm. Um, so I invite you to download these guidebooks for free at our website. We also have some samples outside of the room. And um, stay tuned for our final soil health guide, which will be on soil biology and hopefully coming out this summer. And with that, I'm very happy to take any questions and would like to acknowledge all of the financial support we received for the conference and also for the guidebooks.